tell us about distributional uh, robustness oh. and distribution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't spell either. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, all right. Thanks for the thanks for the chance to come speak. I'll tell you about some of these things. Uh, this is based on joint work with my students Hong Namgung and uh, Aman Sinha. All right. So let me just jump in. So so the motivation for my talk is that. Uh, we do not want machine learned or statistically modeled systems to fail as soon as they get in the real world. Okay? Let me make this a little bit more salient, perhaps. Uh, so this is the first challenge in the talk. Okay? Uh, and, and that challenge is that uh, liking curly fries on Facebook reveals your high IQ. Okay? Uh, and, and, and to me, I mean, there are so many problems with this. First is that there were researchers who did this and actually published it as though this could possibly be true, right? Second is that Wired picked it up. And the third is that clearly this, I mean, is this going to be true tomorrow? Is this going to be true with any different distribution of people than the people they picked, right? And, and, and even more importantly, who doesn't like curly fries? Uh, so, so it's really, it, it, evidently, I don't know, it's completely unclear to me how this could possibly be discriminative. Anyway, so, so you know, you change the distribution a little bit, there's no way this remains true tomorrow, right? Uh, you know, more real challenges, uh, you know, there are certainly changes in, in environment that we're going to see, right? Like, we have Google cars self-driving themselves all around in California and Nevada, right? And then you go to Ann Arbor in uh, April, and it looks a little bit different, right? You know, the, 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 these are not the same environment, right? Uh, there's a third challenge that we face all the time, right? I mean, and, and many of us have seen this, right? We have these, these complex uh, deep neural network models. And starting with work by Ian Goodfellow and colleagues, you can add a tiny amount of perturbation imperceptible to our eyes. And you can change these networks from predicting, say, that this is a picture of a panda with reasonably high confidence, say 50% higher. Uh, now it's a picture of a monkey, OK? So this is a monkey, and this is a panda. And if you guys can't tell the difference between them, then you're not as good as the neural network, clearly, right? Uh, I mean, and, and perhaps more, more of a real issue, and this is something that uh, my colleague Dan Bonet works on. I mean, we could put a transparent film on a stop sign. You and I couldn't even see this. And it could change a computer vision system so that it doesn't even see the stop sign. It sees it as air, right? That's going to be a problem for your self-driving car, OK? So that, that these, these, these things are going to really happen in the real world. OK, so I'm going to uh, sort of look at, look at problems like around these. Uh, and and just, to, just to set the stage, sort of put this on a little bit more mathematical uh, footing, let me start by describing the types of problems that we're going to look at. So sorry, ignore this bottom part uh, temporarily. But what we're going to be looking at is stochastic optimization problems, where we have some loss function, L, and we have a risk, R. R is the risk of our decision vector theta, or whatever our parameter, something like this. And uh, we get, there's some randomness in Z. This is the environment or a random sample or something like that. We have our loss function as a function of theta and Z. And our parameter space is some non-empty closed convex set. And typically, we observe some data sample, uh, ZI drawn IID from some distribution P0 for I equals 1 through N. Typically, we solve something like empirical risk minimization, which is we average our loss over our data, choose our parameter to minimize that. Okay, so we're certainly all familiar with this. Uh, and, but Yin, Inyu did a really nice job this morning setting up distributional robustness, which is going to be kind of the framework that I'm going to spend for the rest of this talk. So this one is spelled correctly, that's good. Uh, so, so typically, you know, we have the classical risk, just the expected loss of our decision vector. Uh, and what we're going to replace this with is some sort of worst case notion of risk, where instead of just the average loss, we look at a worst case notion of, of our expected loss over some family, script P, some set of, uh, some uncertainty set, some family of distributions. Okay, and uh, different choices of uncertainty dis sets yield very different behaviors, and some of them we can actually certify that our parameter that we've learned or our algorithm will actually have good future performance. Okay, and that's what I'm going to try to describe today, two ways we do that. So I'm going to give, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should, I should mention there's been tons of work on this in the optimization literature. Ian Yu described a lot of these papers. Uh, you know, this was one of the first ones with his, was Eric your student? Yeah. yeah, his student Eric, and then others have done a lot of things since then. So I'm going to give two vignettes 
sort of showing some interesting aspects of this distributional approach and their connections with statistics. <coughs> okay, any questions? Sounds good. All right, so, so the first vignette I'm gonna talk about, say, say trying to regularize uh, a learning problem by the variance of our losses. So, so any learning algorithm, I mean, if you've taken your basic statistics class, you know there's a bias and a variance, right? Or we can sometimes call this approximation error and estimation error. And what that, what that ends up looking like is that, you know, you can apply your favorite uh, concentration inequalities, but basically, the true risk of any decision, any parameter vector theta, is upper bounded by your empirical risk. We can call that our bias or our estimation error plus uh, something like the variance, or the square root of the variance over n, plus some term which is, looks like one on n, all right? And this happens with extremely high probability. All right, so, so then you say, well, if this, is, if this is true for all theta, why don't I just uh, trade between these, this, this bias and variance uh, automatically, and minimize the sum of these two quantities? Right, that'd be pretty good. Then we're gonna get a certificate that we're within one on N of whatever we get out of this. Seems like a reasonable idea, right? Uh, okay, we could do that. We would certify that we're gonna have good future performance. Everybody would be happy. Here's a picture of the variance of the absolute value of theta minus X. Um, and I think most of us would agree that that doesn't look very convex, right? I mean, it's con convex kind of and then it bumps up here and it flattens out so so the problem is that the variance is actually wildly non-convex all right so, so that's a little bit of an issue so so uh, so what are we going to do here well what we're going to do is try to be sort of distributionally robust and approximate this in a nice way okay so let's look at this so uh, typically you know we said we're going to solve the empirical risk minimization problem now what we're going to do is look at some kind of weighting of these losses uh, where this set script P is going to be an appropriately chosen set of vectors. All right. So, uh, so, so, so what we're going to do is carefully choose this set P to give us good desired behavior. Okay, so, so right now what I'm going to choose is for our set of uncertainty sets, we're going to choose all distributions P that have a distance and I'll describe this distance shortly from the empirical distribution that goes down as something like rho, which is some specified tolerance you have, divided by n. Okay, and for our, for our divergence, we'll use what's known as the chi-squared divergence. So that's just the integral of the likelihood ratio between p and q minus one squared. Okay? All right, so then what we're going to do is define and then optimize what I will call the empirical likelihood upper confidence bound. So this is a confidence bound on what the true risk should be by just maximizing our weights over this set. Okay. All right, and uh, this is nice because one, I mean, you can see this is gonna be a convex optimization problem because it's the maximum of a bunch of convex functions. And it turns out that uh, in a paper that Hong and I worked out last year, there are efficient solution methods for this. So you can actually define efficient sampling schemes and solve this using stochastic gradient type methods very quickly. I'm not gonna talk about this today. I'll talk about more of the statistical aspects, but you can solve it essentially in the same time as you can solve just the empirical risk minimization problem up to a log n factor. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that soon. But so, that, so my uncertainty set, so, so this choice of chi-squared divergence means that the distributions P that I could possibly choose here have to have the same support as my empirical distribution. So I can't change the support, all I can do now, all I'm doing now is just reweighting things in a not entirely stupid way, basically. Okay? But yeah, good question. We'll talk later about changing the support and actually expanding our distributions. But for now, just reweighting is all we're going to do. But the neat thing is that uh, if we assume that our loss is bounded over the set of parameter vectors that we're looking at, then uh, basically, and this is, there's no probabilities in here at all, this is just a, a true statement, this robust risk is equal to the empirical average plus square root of two rho, that was our sort of robustness tolerance, times the empirical variance over n plus an error term which looks like rho over n, where rho is our uh, sort of robustness parameter. All right. So this is basically says that this is a quite a good approximation to variance. So then we just simply choose our parameter to minimize this quantity. 
All right, so then, uh, so then once you've got this, well then you can apply your favorite empirical process theory, your convergence guarantees, or whatever you want, and uh, you can prove some fun theorems, right? So if, if you assume your parameter space is compact and your losses are Lipschitz or something like that, well then, uh, at least for sort of high enough robustness levels, then with extremely high probability, basically your true risk is upper bounded by the best possible risk plus some kind of variance penalty. So you somehow optimally trade off between this bias and variance in a very natural way by just putting in this little bit of distributional robustness. Okay. All right, so let me, uh, so th this is, uh, th th now we've gone through some of the theoretical results here. I haven't told you how to prove them or anything. They're not uh, the world's most sophisticated things, but I'd like to talk a little bit about how this actually works in practice, right? So, so let's talk about, let me, let me give an example of this. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at uh, an experiment with the Reuters corpus, which is a set of news articles from the Reuters news service. And each article has a number of labels. Uh, and they can either be about uh, corporations, economics, the government, or markets, OK? And so how we're going to do this is we're going to have data coming in pairs, x, y, uh, where x is a d-dimensional vector, represents the document, and y is a vector of four plus minus one labels because a news article can be about multiple different topics. Okay, and so we're gonna minimize the logistic loss on this subject to some L1 constraints on our parameters. All right, so this is a 40,000 dimensional problem with 800,000 samples. Okay, so intuitively what we might expect. I'm just confused, with the loss here, how do you multiply y to x transpose? Ah, uh, good question. What, yeah, that's a, that's a mistake. Uh, what we're doing is we just look at the average loss. So we look at sum from uh, j equals 1 up to 4 of the individual y's. e to the minus yj x transpose theta j. Is that, that's what it actually is. Yes, sorry. OK. Good question. So, so what, do we might, what we might expect from this, actually, is that if, we, if you think about these, the, this problem, you know, so there's each, each, uh, sorry, each category has fairly different kind of numbers of articles associated to it. Okay, so if we're regularizing the variance of our predictions, we might expect that you know, somehow we should try to equalize performance across all of these. Right? If you were just doing straight up minimizing the average loss, then you might sacrifice performance, say, in the rare classes for better performance in the more common classes because we wouldn't care. We just want best average performance. But if we're penalizing the variance, well, having bad performance something rarely is going to increase our variance disproportionately. And uh, OK, let's punt on that. But this, this actually shows that that is exactly what happens. OK, let me give a plot. We can see this a little bit better. So, what I'm plotting here is what I'll call the, so, so if you recall, economics is the rarest category. So what I'm plotting here, the vertical axis is the recall, the proportion of times that a document is economics and we correctly label it as being about economics. And this penalty here is our robustness penalty. And what you see is that just zero robustness, no regularization by variance, we get the economics category right about 70% of the time, or 68. And as we bump up the regularization, we're starting to get it right about 80% of the time. Okay, so we go from 68 to 80, so about a 10% increase in performance. And uh, there's really no degradation, actually, in the performance on the other classes. So you are, right, you are essentially doing what I said. Okay. Um, and then this just plots the confidence bound. So, so we actually do certify that we'll have good performance, although our certificates are a bit uh, conservative. Right, so this is, what we pre this is an upper bound we guarantee that we will have, and this is the true risk of our predictor as we increase the robustness penalty. But we are seeing kind of regularization by variance, and you are certifying good performance. All right, so let me, uh, let me now switch gears a little bit. Um, How do the weights look in this example? Do How do they look? Yeah, do you get the big weights for the economics? Or like I didn't look at the weights. I mean, it's like a 200,000 dimensional problem, so I wasn't doing a whole lot of digging into it, but I probably could. But I don't know what they look like at all. Yeah. All right, so let me give uh, a second vignette now. 
and talk a little bit about a slightly different way of doing uh, robustness. So, so we're going to now actually start looking at changing the distribution of the data, changing its support even. All right, so, so I said earlier, we don't want machine learning systems to fail when they get into the real world, and I think I want to be a little more aggressive than that. I think actually, and I mean, you know, probably very few of us are working on self-driving cars, but it is irresponsible to release systems into the real world whose robustness we don't understand, right? I mean, I have this nightmare where it's like, you know, uh, John Ducci said this self-driving car was safe, and then it drove through a school bus full of children, right? That would be bad. Um, hopefully that won't happen. But, you know, so I, I think it's, it behooves us to sort of try to understand robustness a little bit more carefully and how this applies to different learning algorithms. So, uh, you know, these are the challenges that we're working with, right? That, that this changes, this kind of perturbation changes this from a panda to a given. And we have to drive in multiple environments. So, so the type of robustness I want to start by thinking about looking at is, you know, one idea might be, okay, instead of looking at our loss L, let's just look at worst case perturbations of our loss. So we have our data Z, we perturb it a little bit in some small ball around the data, okay? Whatever our loss is. And uh, this seems like a reasonable idea, and if we could do this, it would be great. Uh, and certainly many folks have looked at this, so Ian Goodfellow, uh, my colleague Percy Liang and his student Robin, others, uh, Madri's looked at it, is he here? here? I don't know if he's here. No. Okay, well Madri's looked at it too. Uh, you know, so there's a bunch of sort of heuristics for solving this and more advanced ideas based on this idea of looking at a worst case perturbation of individual losses. Now there's this minor issue that usually this is MP hard, uh, and in a neural network, you know, these systems where we actually do classification, it is honestly NP-hard to compute these. Oh. Interesting. <laughs> All right. It actually is NP-hard to compute these, right? So that seems, I mean, if something's actually NP-hard to compute the robust loss, it suggests to me it's probably going to be tough to certify that it'll be good to, you know, adversarial perturbations. All right, so, so this is maybe not going to quite work. So how can we figure out how to change the distribution the right way to actually get robustness and do this also computationally efficiently? So, so the way to do this, we're going to do this via what are known as Wasserstein distances, uh, or we're going to base our ideas on Wasserstein distances. So, so for any cost function C, which is basically just any function on Z cross Z, our data space, to the reals, uh, the Wasserstein distance, or the transport distance, is the basically well, let's just draw a picture because it'll be a little bit clearer. It's the infimal coupling between the distributions P and Q, meaning I look at the best possible mar uh, joint distribution, joint measure over Z1 and Z2, such that M has P and Q as its marginal distributions. But the best way to think about this is I have a distribution P, I have a distribution Q, and I ask what's the most efficient way to move mass from P into Q. Okay, so we can look at, we can define a distance in terms of this sort of earth movers distance or Wasserstein distance. And then we're going to just look at distributionally robust risks now, where this set script P is a Wasserstein ball around some basic base distribution. All right, so, so this actually allows us to change the support of our distribution at least a little bit and might allow us to get some robustness. Now, uh, this has been studied in the robust optimization literature in simpler cases like, I don't know, uh, support vector machines, logistic regression. There's a minor issue that often this is still actually NP hard. Whoops. All right. So we, we continue to need, we're, we still, we remain in search of solutions. All right. So, so here's a simple insight. And now we're moving, departing the realm of like actually really nailing this to being slightly heuristic, but we are still going to be able to give certificates. So if our loss function, L of theta Z is actually smooth in Z, sort of the data we're observing, then life gets a little bit easier because for any large enough lambda, this function, the supremum over delta of perturbations to our data Z minus this quadratic is efficient to compute, right? Because this becomes a strongly concave function as soon as lambda is big enough. So we can actually compute this efficiently. And then once we have this, I mean, this is a trivial observation, but as soon as we have this, then, well, it turns out there's a nice duality between worst case Wasserstein risks and these kinds of uh, perturbations using a negative cost function. And that's this theorem. So for any distribution, 
on, uh, on Z in any cost function, uh, lower semi-continuous cost, but let's punt on that. Basically, the worst case Wasserstein distance is actually the infimum over all lambda greater than or equal to zero of the expected sort of robustified loss plus lambda times rho. So you can just do a duality calculation, you're gonna get that to pop out. And so now, if you go back to this previous slide, here's our loss, all we have to do is compute this guy, at least for large lambda. Okay, so our idea is just we're gonna ignore that infimum, pick a big enough lambda, and then we're gonna just solve, minimize the expected robust loss. And we can actually compute this. And as long as the loss itself is smooth in the data, we're in good shape. And, uh, and so, you know, we can do stochastic gradient descent for these things. This is fairly easy. We just draw a data point from our distribution, approximately maximize this, and then update using gradient descent. Uh, you, you know, this converges with all the usual convergence guarantees. If you're convex, it converges. If the loss is non-convex, it finds stationary points. Everything still kind of goes through in the same ways. All right. And if it's non-convex, is it, maybe it's gonna distribute. Is it exactly like a GAN? Is it exactly like a GAN? I don't think it's exactly like a GAN. I mean, I don't know exactly what the connections are gonna be. So I'm not 100% sure, but thank you. Oh, why you can't optimize over lambda? Can you just also put it into the... Yeah, so the question is why can't I optimize over lambda? Because I wanted to take this infimum. The reason I can't, I need lambda to be big enough so that I can actually compute this worst case perturbation. Okay, so I need to have lambda big enough so that I can actually compute these perturbations to make this easy and computationally efficient. Because if it's small, then again, it becomes NP hard. So we can't give sort of arbitrary levels of robustness, we can give some levels of robustness. And so you can uh, basically, again, using duality, we can show that if you, if you get this, basically with high probability for any parameter in our parameter space, and uniformly in all possible robustness levels, that the expected sort of robust Wasserstein loss is upper bounded by our empirical loss plus this little penalty, all right? And so you could also estimate it. You can actually estimate how robust you are by computing these worst case perturbations and then just taking their average. Then you can basically come up with certificates that you will be robust to perturbations this large. All right, so, so the theory is, is kind of fun, um, but uh, you know, we actually did implement these things and see if they work and then we fiddled around and we did some fun stuff. So let me, let me give some examples of this. So, so basically, okay, so, so what's the first part of this? So typically we run a neural network, I mean, Tang, you showed us a bunch of them where we have uh, hard, or basically soft thresholding floating around in the network, right? Rectified linear units, things like that. These are not smooth, they're not differentiable, so we're gonna replace them with some kind of smooth approximation so we can actually run our code and actually implement these methods and we're gonna see what happens. So some of this is basically reading tea leaves, so you should just take it with a grain of salt, but just to give some picture of what's going on. So here, this is a trivial classification problem. I'm just saying the label y is equal to the sine of the two norm of x minus square root two, okay? So I have a positive class and a negative class, or maybe it's negative and positive, whatever. All right, and I'm plotting the decision boundaries that each uh, possible classifier learns. So this is empirical risk minimization. It's a good classifier, but it's kind of goofy looking. This is a heuristic method for getting robustness, and then this is our sort of Wasserstein robust method. And you can see, I mean, again, this is reading tea leaves, but this looks nice and circular. It's far away from both edges, which is kind of what you would hope to see. All right, but we can also give real results. So here's, uh, here are our perturb here's, um, sorry, here's classification error on MNIST. And I have actually a non-convex problem, so it's a three convolutional layer neural network, uh, fully connected logistic loss on the top, and I'm plotting our error as a function of how much perturbation we're allowing an adversary to make to our input examples. And each of these plots is a different fitting method, so the black line is empirical risk minimization. You can see it's pretty crappy. Very quickly it has essentially 100% errors. And these are some other methods with, this is, uh, what's known as the fast gradient method. So you just do a one gradient based perturbation. This is another iterative method that folks have used. And then this is this robustness method based on Wasserstein kind of certificates. And you can see there is a gap here. So there really is better behavior for different, for even more adversarial things. Nati? How are you plotting, um, you'd said it's hard to calculate this area if you're plotting it somehow. 
Right. So you're asking. So the question is, what are, what's the actual attack we're using? Yeah. So so we did this with four, five, five different attacks, and the plot always looks the same no matter what attack we use. So one attack is just using you put a negative quadratic on it and you perturb it as much as you're allowed. So that's basically the Wasserstein attack. One is uh, Goodfellow's fast gradient, fast sine gradient method attack. One is projected gradient descent, just heuristically on your non-convex objective. And the fourth one is the iterated fast gradient sine method. And all of these are efficient algorithms, right? So all of these are efficient algorithms. So how much do you think it's underestimating there? By how much? So the truth, these are all deeply lower bounds in there, right? Yes. So by how much do you think the fact that you're limiting your attacks to only efficient attacks, because these attacks are actually lower, I mean, it is, how much are you underestimating the actuator? I have no idea. I don't know. Uh, all white box. What's that? It's an all white box, right? All white box attack. These yeah. are all white box attacks. Yeah. These are all white box attacks. I mean, with the, the Wasserstein attack, we know we're getting it exactly because we've set the, the lambda penalty large enough that the actual problem is concave, so we can maximize. But, you know, and that's a certain level of robustness. But I can't guarantee that we're getting the worst case attack. I mean, we're use, we used all the attacks, not all, because there's like hundreds of them, but we used five of the common attacks we found in the literature, and this plot was basically identical for all of them. I don't know. If you have suggestions for other things to, to run, I'm happy to do them. No, I mean, what I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that you're, you're in some sort of maybe robust against those attacks that are actually efficient. That's, yeah, so that's possible. We're robust against efficient attacks. But I don't know. That seems like a hard thing to show. Thank you. I guess you can also provide some certi uh, certification, right? Uh, what is the worst case possible error, right? Like, yes. Well, yeah, no, this, so this is this theorem right here is that we actually have, basically, for any level row of perturbations you're willing to allow in the underlying distribution, we will have error no worse than this. But, like, I guess, uh, to answer Nati's question, you can just uh, really yeah. get that number and see what's the gap between yeah. that number and all of the text. Yeah, so we could get that gap. And I don't have that plot right now. So I don't know what exactly it is. All right, I mean, this is a different, this is a different attack. And you can see the plot looks exactly the same. So. Uh, now we can go back to, so these were actually, this is actually real data. Let's go back to reading tea leaves again. We can ask, okay, what do the perturbations look like that give us, ac actually get us confused? All right, so this is an eight. This is the original image that we classify as an eight. If you have a network fit by empirical risk minimization, this is the eight where it starts to classify things as a three. Okay, that looks like an eight to me. This is uh, another method. This, this is the image where it starts to classify this eight as a three. This is a particular iterated fast gradient method. This is Madri's projected gradient method, and this is where our method gets confused and starts to think this is a three. I mean, again, this is reading tea leaves, but to me, that looks like a three. That almost looks like a three, and the rest of them all look like eights. So at least, you know, heuristically, from a human vision perspective, this looks a lot better than things before. All right. Uh, I can show you some funny plots where we did some reinforcement learning, where we changed the gravity of different uh, pendulum balancing things. But uh, I think there's a reception now. Seb tells me I have two minutes. Is there beer at the reception? I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Who's an organizer? I don't take care of the beer, sorry. Does anyone know if there's beer at the? Uh, uh, Steve says, all right, there's always beer. Let's call it a day. Let's go drink. All right, thanks for your attention. Uh, happy to take some questions. Simple enough settings, like when, for instance, data is like uh, sufficiently Gaussian, in which like the perturbed objective just boils down to the say the standard L2 regularization and so on. Yeah. So the question is, are there situations where different robust objectives boil down to types of regularization we know? And the answer is more or less yes. Uh, if you have like a standard linear model, like an SVM or a logistic regression or something like that, then a lot of these Wasserstein robustness things end up becoming regularization, classical regularization. So, uh, and that's Esfahani and Kuhn, I think. Is that right in you? Yeah, yeah so that's, that's some work by uh, the, these two guys. Where are they? I forget where, but anyway. Yeah, Zurich. Zurich, yeah. So yeah, so there are situations in simple cases where that is, that is exactly what happens. That's 
No, that's when the, the problem is like SVM. When your loss is like the hinge loss or a logistic loss or something like that, then these reduce, then this Wasserstein robustness reduces to classical regularization techniques. But we can, you can apply this in more complex non-convex models and you'll get a certificate out of some sort, but we have no idea what that actually looks like. Yeah. So you said your theorem applies if the loss function is well behaved. Mm -hmm. But in, in many of these examples that happen, the loss function isn't well behaved because you just tweak a little bit and it's a completely different answer. So how does that? How does this address that? I see. So okay. So that's that. So, so so there are two issues here, right? So so one is when you actually apply this thing and actually get classifications out, and one is when you look at the loss function. Okay, so our loss function, as long as the loss function is smooth in the data, then this theorem will apply. Yeah. So even, even with these deep networks, if you replace the, if you have sort of smooth nonlinearities, then these theorems still apply and you're in good shape. Uh, now, when you actually run classification schemes, of course, it's just zero or one. You predict it or you didn't predict. And so then, now this gets into a question of when is one, and when is sort of this, uh, you know, loss that you're using an appropriate uh, surrogate for a zero one loss, and that's a harder question. Well, in many of those examples, they give out a confidence level, which is not really confidence, but you know, it's 98% that says it's this, and then you just tweak it a little bit, and it says 99% is this, and it's completely wrong. So right. Isn't that kind of well, I mean, so, okay, so I should have a plot that also addresses this, exactly what you said, but roughly, I mean, this, this is sort of doing the inverse of that, this is asking how far do we have to perturb this image to become more confident that it's a three than an eight. And so you can see from this that, you know, as we have more careful robustness, you really have to start perturbing this to look like a three. Yeah, I actually had a question about this. Did you perturb these in exactly the same way? So you're going from this one to that one in exactly the same path, or did you have to pick different paths for it? Uh, for each, well, so, so, so the adversary knows the network, and so it's basically a white box attack, so they have slightly different paths. It picks the worst thing for the particular network you have. Yes. But you use the fast cleaning sound or something? Like what's the attack uh, Like because I think if you use fast cleaning sound, then you're going to have always the same internal. Like every pixel will have exactly the same perturbation. Right. The attack is the Wasserstein attack. Oh, I see. Yeah. Also, that's my question. No. I can give you an example of that. So take the function minus absolute value of x. This looks like this. I don't care how big a quadratic you add to that, it will never be convex. But that is a one Lipschitz function. Yeah, so we really so smoothness is essential for this. If we don't have smoothness, we're monkeyed. We're totally I, I said if we if we actually ran this with ReLUs, I have said nothing. Um, so, thank you. Uh, so I guess you are using L2 in the, the definition, the W, what's the step two, right? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to change it to an infinity norm or something? <sighs> Not in our current results, because the infinity norm squared will never be strongly convex. And so you can never actually make that function concave. Uh, you could use like P norms for P less than two and it'd be okay. But for p greater than two, it'll be you're gonna have problems, basically. <clears throat> okay, let's take the rest. Oh, All right. fine, yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna get to the beers. <laughs>